Hi, Tomiko. I know I don't look like Danica, but. Oh, that's okay. If you, I was worried. I'm like, oh, was I sent a link? It's been so long since I've Zoomed. So. Ah. All good. Right. Um, yeah, so Danica, unfortunately, isn't able to moderate this session because she had some family stuff to deal with, but she'll be back oh. in a little bit. Um, so I've, I'm, I'm on my second computer. I've uh, launched the Zoom room for you, and so I'll be here to do my um, best to kind of moderate and, and uh, get you started. But I've made you co-host, and as people uh, pop in, we'll, we'll just, uh, um, yeah, kind of get started. Okay. Hey. Sorry? I just started up the recording again to me going it is 10 30 and we've got people showing up okay um i for those of you who are just joining i know i don't look like danica because i'm not danica uh, Danica had to step out so i'm just briefly uh stepped in and and uh we'll be helping to moderate this session for tomiko and we will get started here in just one second i just have to do one more thing let me get that up there What's your name again? I'm sorry. Thomas. Sorry. Yeah, I guess I should have said that because it doesn't say Thomas. It says Danica. Everybody, let me... thank, thank you, Thomas, for helping no me. You've been essential. <laughs> Here, let me rename myself so it doesn't confuse people quite as much. Oh, and I had a question. If I want to see the chat mm -hmm. while I'm doing this, is there a way to move it so that it, I can't seem to move it? It just seems to sit right in the center of my screen. Your chat? Yeah. Um, the easiest way to do it is i'm trying to remember um uh, that's yeah from the presenter view sorry i've always worked with more than one monitor so it's easy because i just pull it over to the other monitor but oh, you should be yeah smart. you should be able to um just do this uh you should be able to uh some chat and then yeah in the in the top of the window you should be able to click on the window and just drag it to the side but if you want i can just i mean i'll be keeping an eye on the chat pretty pretty well so if there's any stuff okay. that pops up i'll i'll just kind of okay because i want to like ask questions and yeah. get people to good yeah and hopefully you know we'll have people being um and unmuting as well so that we can get some yeah uh, some chatter going, but yeah, I will, I will monitor the chat if you have a hard time seeing it and then we'll. Okay. Um, See what I can do. Yeah. Uh, just one last thing. It's today. Today's the 22nd, isn't it? No, yeah. 23rd today. Yes, it's the 23rd. Yeah. Getting my days wrong. Yeah. Have you got your shot yet? So. I did. I'm I'm also a paramedic, and so I got oh, wow. quite a while ago. Um, so I do feel blessed, uh, but I got yeah, the rest of my family for the most part is still waiting. But mm. my wife, my wife is an ICU nurse, so she also has her shot. So that's helpful. But oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. It's all safe at your house. So. It's pretty safe at our house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alrighty, I think we'll get started. All right, sounds good. Um, so I will, yeah, welcome everybody to uh, to this session. I'm I'm moderating the session, so I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. But I'm I'm honored and, and excited to be introducing Tomiko Nicholson from the uh, Abbey Virtual School, right? Yes. And um, you have a lot of experience with uh, with uh, Abbotsford Virtual School, and uh, I know that you've. Yeah, design some pretty innovative programs there. And we're really excited to be learning from you today. So on behalf of the BCDL executive and all of our sponsors, of course, uh, thank you for running a session and and we're looking forward to having some rich dialogue with you this morning. So over to you, Tomiko. All right, thanks. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, I'm very excited to like uh, be doing this and I may have, um, I would like it to be like everyone gets involved. So feel free to like, um, unmute yourself if you have a question and uh, be chatty in the chat so we can um, answer your questions as we go along. All right, let's see here. So the it's um, the whole concept is about using a world citizen lens to be anti-racist and inclusive. Um, it uh, provides a positive framework to be inclusive and it's a way to counter isms and phobias. 
So I think it's good like to start off the year with your kids to say you're a world citizen, but what does that mean? So maybe what I'll do to get people involved and get their wheels turning is uh, maybe in the chat or you can unmute yourself and say what you think a world citizen is. Go my chat. I feel crickets. It's silence out there, but sometimes it takes a little minute for people to start uh, typing. So we'll give them a minute. But Julia, I think you unmuted. Go ahead, Julia. I do. That's a big question. I mean, yeah. a citizen generally means you have some rights and responsibilities within your country, but a world citizen, does that mean we have rights and responsibilities across the globe? Yeah. That's and then a what good would that look like? It. Yeah. Thank you for your comments, Julia. Uh, somebody, Cheryl's written, uh, knows what's happening in the world, not just their own country. Oh, yes, I like that. A human who lives on this globe as situated from where and how and who you live with. Oh, that feels sort of very philosophical. All right, so th those are some good ideas. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to just flip to the next page. I've got a definition. Oh, did somebody just add another? Yeah, somebody just added. Yeah, Chelsea Woods added, we have rights and responsibilities across the globe, aware that we are all connected and our actions have impact beyond our borders. Nice. So, here, let me just go. so here's the definition I've kind of like got from uh, Oxfam. It's a person who strives to be aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it. Uh, world Citizen takes an active role in their community and works to make our world more equitable, fair, and sustainable, encourages themselves and others to grow the knowledge, skills, and values they need to engage with the world around them, and they believe that everyone can make a difference. So it's kind of like, um, for my English course, I sort of started off like this, sort of, it's sort of empowering and makes them feel connected, and my goal is uh, teachers to prepare them for the world. Yeah, make it all positive and happy. Um, so for this workshop, these are the main things I hope you um, come away with with regards to being inclusive and fighting the isms and phobias of our world is uh, to help kids see the problem, to represent uh, people from marginalized groups positively, uh, to find ways to change your content, to share your own stories and encourage kids to share their stories and to act for change. I'm tapping. So I'd like to start off with the idea that um, I, a lot, like even my own friends and family say like, I don't see color or gender or sexual orientation. I just see people as people. And although the sentiment is positive, uh, it's unfortunately not the truth of our world. Uh, a number of studies have been done that show that babies see racial differences and that prejudice starts really early. Um, being white is preferred by age four. And sadly, this is the case even for like preschoolers of color that they don't feel comfortable in their own skin and wish they had different hair color and eye color. Um, other studies have shown that teaching color blindness to, you know, we don't see color actually increases biases in white people and it decreases the cognitive performance of people of color. Because basically if something racist happens, it's like, oh, we're not racist, that didn't happen. It kind of gaslights their experience. Um, Molly, uh, Melody Hobson, um, she's got some great TED Ed videos. I like her quote, it's time we become comfortable with the uncomfortable conversations about race. Instead of being colorblind, we need to be color brave. And um, I'm gonna uh, like, and racism is kind of the, the focus, but I mean, it, it deal, um, there's a whole bunch of other, you know, like homophobia and uh, xenophobia, et cetera, um, that could sort of fit into what I'm doing in this workshop. So what I'm gonna give everybody is a free pair of global citizen glasses, Woohoo! It will help you see new perspectives and help you make change. You can do this with your students. Um, you can say like, okay, now we're gonna put in our global citizen glasses so we can like understand this better. And if you want, you can even get them to make like Piper, uh, what is it? Uh, pipe cleaner ones at home just for fun or draw their own to uh, remind them that they, um, it's a, the glasses metaphor is just a nice way to, for kids to like uh, change their mindset about learning how to see from a different perspective. So uh, this is an activity for you to do. 
So right now, go into Google under images, and I'm going to get you to type in school boy, so make it school space boy, otherwise you get a, a rapper named school boy, and then uh, do the same for school girl. And then either um, <clears throat> I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And then either in the chat or if you want to uh, speak up, you can share what you saw on both those pages, uh, what you saw as the differences. What does it say about our society and how it sees boys and men versus girls and women? And then also take a look about like how is the racial diversity makeup on each of your searches of those images? and uh, did it show like people with disabilities, et cetera. So I'll just give you some time to do that right now. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so what, what you'll what people are saying is well definitely should not have looked this up on this uh, on the school computer up the word schoolgirl and um, for schoolgirls it has many sexualized images whereas for schoolboys it's mostly just boys in uniforms and, and uh, somebody said mostly white and so this this to me is like if people say there's no sexism or racism this is an instant easy way to show that yes yes there is because um, uh, it's so sad that just simple word like school girl could get such a negative response. So a girl wanting to see um, pictures of herself, is she getting that from these pictures? And what is the, what is the message is that we're also giving to boys with this as well? So um, I wouldn't recommend doing this with younger kids. You could probably do with like older kids in high school to have a discussion about it and what it says about our society and uh, get them to brainstorm later about like, what can we do to, to fix this? Yeah, so most of the pictures, um, it's Isha, Isha is saying that all white, able-bodied, yeah. Chelsea's saying, well, I'm glad I looked at the boys first. There, yeah, there's two pictures of boys that are sexualized, but, um, for girls it's only two that are not yeah so uh i've got an exercise you can use with students that kind of helps deal with this in a similar way but has less sexualization but i think it's important uh, to talk to kids about the fact that there is a lot of content that you don't want to see and to help them to learn searches so they're not getting like this toxic uh, junk food images from the internet so what I, um, this next one is Googling happy boss and happy secretary. For whatever reason, if you use the adjective happy, it actually cuts away a lot of the sexualized material. Like if you go back and you don't want to like um, type in happy school girl and happy school boy, it'll um, have less sexualized material. So I would, um, you can do this right now, Google happy boss and happy secretary and uh, do the same thing. What is the gender and race for most images in each of the searches. And um, if you're visiting Space Alien, uh, would you think women can be bosses or men could be secretaries? So I'll get you guys to put that in right now and then you can. Yeah, so what are people saying? Yeah, uh, Louise is saying, um, happy boss is all men. Uh, Isha is saying, happy boss, all men, a bit more racial diversity, but not much. Uh, Emily is saying, secretaries are young white women, yes. And so the question you could, uh, if you're doing this with kids after you've done this is, uh, if you were a space alien and you're using the internet to find out about bosses and secretaries, what, what are you learning? Do you, do you think that women can be bosses? Do you think that men can be secretaries? Yep, Cheryl's saying it's very stereotypical. So this is after you've done this exercise with the kids, the next thing you can do is talk about what a, a stereotype is, a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or information about a, of a particular type of person. Oops, sorry. 
Did I going the wrong way? There we go. Whoops. Hold them in. Sorry. Technical difficulties. No, I need to go. All right, here we go. Yeah, so um, the last question there is, um, or this is the next thing is to, to solve the problem. I'll get you to um, Google under images, happy male secretary, and then Google happy female boss and see what you get. Oh, let's see here. So, yeah. So, if you type in "happy female boss," you get predominantly white women, um, and they. Uh, you just saying they still look like "quote unquote" boss males. Yep, they're sort of modeling after that. Yep. But a lot of the happy female bosses, they're just the one woman in the picture. There's not often like more people around them as much as it was with the men. Oh, oh, that's an isolation. Yeah, that's a good observation. So you can talk about kids about like, why do you think you didn't find images of men as secretaries uh, when you Google secretary? And why do you think you didn't find images of women when you Googled boss? And so ideally, the kids will figure out that yes, it's to do with stereotypes, but it's a way for them to see how you know, Google isn't perfect. It just reflects what our society already thinks. Um, let's see here, we've got C. Richardson saying, male secretaries seem to have a bit more racial diversity. Cheryl App, bosses are only in offices. That's also, yeah, that's a stereotype. Um, Isha saying, many repeat images for happy female boss also found those images in happy secretary. Oh, interesting. So uh, uh, another question after you've done, done this process with kids, you can talk about like, how can we encourage girls to be bosses and boys to be secretaries? So this could be like a great discussion. You could even make this like, you know, inquiry-based project if you wanted to. Um, but the idea is what you can talk about is how important images are and how it affects how we see and think about the world and how when you Google something, um, you are going to more likely get stereotypical images and it's not gonna show you the diversity of your world. And as a world citizen, we wanna encourage seeing the diversity because our world is diverse. Oh, let me just see somebody else said something in the chat. Um, H Judge says, happy male secretary still looks like they're bosses. There's a lot of images with a man and a female. So you have to be unbiased in your view that the male is a secretary in the image. Oh, that's a good point. Let's see here. So another thing you can do is uh, you can create a Google Images scavenger hunt um, to help kids learn how to search with more diversity for images. So what you want to teach them is not taking the very first image they, they find online. Like, um, so don't if you just click boss, don't just click boss and find the first one. Challenge your kids to find a First Nations female boss. Um, so if you want, you can go through some of these and check them out. So you can number three is like look up basketball player see what you see, and then look up Asian basketball player. Because when you look up basketball player, you're not going to see an Asian basketball player. You're mostly going to see black people playing basketball and men as well. Um, same thing, there's like mathematician. So if you want, I'll just give you a couple minutes, you can go, go through this. So to um, also like, if, um, if you wanna see a person with a disability, rarely will you see that in a Google search. You will have to specifically search for that if you wanna have representative uh, images. Um, in the work that you create with your kids. So I role model this myself and all the, in the presentations and information images I, I use with my students. And I also talk about this process um, and um, get them to go through this so they can learn how to do this. All right, 
it's gonna go to the next one. So yeah, you can make your own scavenger hunt a variety of things, but the idea is just to sort of think about what's the stereotype when you look up that image and then like try to see who's not represented it very often in those images and get kids to search it out. Oh, somebody's gonna just check my chat here. Oh, Louise Campbell, wow, teacher with a disability brings up a lot of able-bodied teachers working with students with disabilities, right? So, and even that, you can talk about kids like, this is still, even when you try to search for it, it's it's not a perfect search. And some things you actually won't find any images for, which is also sad. So, um, World citizens uh, dig diversity and they also dig for diversity. It's sort of the message you wanna to give to kids. Uh, using positive images and information of marginalized people, uh, studies show that it breaks stereotypes and it builds empathy for all kids. Uh, also importantly is it builds self-esteem and improves the mental health of kids from marginalized groups. Because imagine like you, if you rarely see images of yourself or you only see negative ones, um, your, your sense of self and where you belong isn't as strong. So anything we can do to um, create a, a world citizen space and what we create in, in our classrooms helps um, uh, mar people from marginalized groups feel more included in the class because they already don't feel included in society. Oh, I'm just gonna check my me chat messages here. Um, Annalise added an activity that I like to do uh, is have Students draw a scientist, could work with any other things too. It's interesting to see what kind of bias they have, then discuss after. Oh, that's a great one. Uh, Julia says she put in disabled teacher in quotes and the pics were great. And that's the other thing too. As you do this with your students, you can talk about, oh, this is the best way to kind of find this kind of picture. So, because another thing I notice, like if I type in Japanese squirrel girl, that usually doesn't get the greatest sexualized material. But if I type in like um, Japanese school girl studying or Japanese school girl riding a bicycle, you'll get um, more specific pictures that are actually age appropriate, not sexualized. So here's an exercise called the World Village Exercise. This would make a great math lesson, but you could use it in social studies or any class as well. If the world was a village of 10 people, guess how many would be Africans, Asians, Europeans, Latin Americans slash Caribbeans, and North Americans, Oceanians? So I'll give you like a a little time here to like write down your answers. Um, like some, you know, do, 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 like some music there while you uh, put your answers to this. And um, some of you may already know, but for um, my students, the re this result was like pretty shocking. Oh, here I'm tapping in. So if the world was just 10 people, there would be one African, six Asians, one European, one Latin American slash Caribbean, and one North American Oceanian. So um, for my kids, they were shocked to realize that white people were a minority. Like based on what we see when we Google online, when we watch TV, when we basically interact anywhere in our world, it, it's very um, white male dominated. And so for them to realize that they're the um, minority if they're white is pretty shocking. And even for kids um, like uh, my own daughter, we're multi, she's multiracial. Um, she was shocked to realize how many Asians there were in the world. She's like, oh, I'm not alone. So this, uh, if you do teach math, this is a nice way to um, do a little math while um, helping your students become world citizens. You could get them to like graph this, pie chart this. Um, uh, you can also make it to teach fractions and percents. So based on this, out of 10, what percent of the world are people of color? Mental math, oh, somebody gonna tell me? What's in here in the chat? Oh, 90, it's close, uh, let me go, it's 80. So if, if there's nothing else you take away from this workshop, this to me is like the most important thing, it's represent reality recipe. So people of color make up about 80% of the world, uh, women make up 50% of the world, people with disabilities make up 15% of the world, that's like a billion people. People who are LGBTQ plus make up about 10% of the world, um, it's hard to get exact stats on that, but I uh, sort of ranges between like 5% to, to 20%. I've read different studies, so I've just kind of gone with 10. People with a mental health condition make up at least 10% of the world. And I think it's important to share these numbers with students because it helps marginalized kids know they're not alone. So um, if a student in your class has a bit disability, you can say, you know, 
there's a billion other people who are like facing the same issue that you're facing. You're not alone. I think it's so important. Or if you're in a class that's primarily white for that uh, child of color to realize that, hey, out there, there's billions and billions of people like me. So by making that world citizen connection, it makes um, people from marginalized groups feel like, hey, I, I, I've got my people. If I go travel, I can meet them. And uh, although we can't travel a lot now because of COVID, um, they can uh, virtually. Oh, I'm just going to check the chat here. Yeah, I would. Yeah. So again, these are Cheryl saying I would expect mental health to be higher. I would expect it to be higher, especially now too. So um, these are just kind of general stats. There's all like sort of, oh, here another chat in there. Um, it's true, I would suspect these are especially if you looked at the statistics, what would mental health be classified as? Yeah, that, that would be interesting. So I got these um, stats like from a world population web, website and um, a lot of them are, are based on people taking census surveys. So it, um, yeah, it's not super exact, but it's still sort of a base to, to work from. So I use this um, represent reality recipe for everything that um, I, I create and in the space I have in my um, classroom. So I try to like hit as much and as many of this in anything I do. And always I'm taking one of these, at least one of these colors of the rainbow for everything I do and aiming for at least two or three of them in everything I do. So I went through my course and any image that I have, it's 80% are people of color. I made sure that the images and information I have, it's women make up 50%. Um, I've included uh, images of people with disabilities, um, people who are LGBTQ and mental health is kind of harder, but like as far as images go, but um, you can use it as in the content, like the books you choose and um, the, the storage, I teach English. So I can use, I can add this kind of stuff through the, the content. Oh, I've just got one more chat thing here. Um, oh, it's just saying about how you define, how you define mental health. Yes, that would change how the stats show. Um, so after you like show kids that information, you can set, you can um, like get them to look at this picture and say, you know, which one would better represent um, our world. And I think for a lot of students, their image of the world is the first picture. And it, it's um, a change to think that the second picture is actually the reality of our world. I'm just gonna check the chat. Oh, would you be willing to share? Yeah, I'm happy to share everything. I just like, this is, this is like hot off the press <laughs> presentation. So uh, for sure, um, Louise, you can check in with me and I'll, I'll, I can send you a link to the presentation and anybody else. Um, so yeah, so basically this is an example of like, yeah, so if I went through my course originally, I would say a lot of my course material is this first picture and I changed it to be this more representative, like this second picture in my course. Um, so here's a represent people positively exercise. Um, you can tell all your students, I'm making a slideshow about the diversity of students at my school, and I want to choose a photo to represent Japanese students. So you can look at the following photos, and which photos would you use or not use, explain why. I've used, because uh, I'm um, Japanese, I'm um, biracial, so I've used these pictures to thinking about my own response to when I've seen these pictures in school. So you can just look at the pictures and just think about, okay, I'm looking for a picture to represent Japanese people. Which of these pictures would I use or not use? What are the pros and cons to them? And you can just put it in the chat or talk. I might use the black and white one of the school kids, but not the rest, unless I was looking specifically at a geisha tradition in the presentation. Yes. And I'm not certain what the other, I know one's from a Disney cartoon, but the other ones I don't, Really recognize, yeah. Other than the one stereotype. Oh, okay, I'm just gonna go check in the chat here. Um, if it's Japanese people in your school, they should represent the culture you might see in the school. Yes, I agree, Cheryl. And um, you should saying same. I would use the picture of the students. Yeah, I'm just thinking that that picture of the students 
to me looks kind of like it's a stereotypical like Japanese school. It doesn't look like a Canadian school. So if you're trying to represent the Japanese people in your school, the Japanese people in your school wouldn't be sitting like that. So it's it's almost like you're saying that the Japanese people in the school are transplanted there or not part of that culture. Whereas I feel like if they're in the school, they're part of the school's culture as well as their own um, ancestral identity. Yeah. Oh, so uh, yeah, Nicole says, I think it's related to um, internment camps and it is that, that black and white picture is a picture of Japanese kids from an internment camp. <sighs> And then somebody said, I almost said to choose none of them because of um, the black and white one is old. Yeah, so yeah, these are all great points. So for myself, because now I present mostly white, but when I was a kid, um, it's very clear to everyone, because uh, my, my school is primarily white, uh, that I was Asian. And I, I hated that any time to represent Japan that they use geisha images because one, it's sort of like, it's like a picture of like a beauty pageant person that wouldn't really represent um, a Canadian. It's just so specific and small. And as a Japanese Canadian, I'm like a fourth generation person here. And um, I've ne I never went to Japan until I was an adult. So I just felt like that never represented me. Uh, pictures of geisha girls. Uh, the one in the left with a little bit of tape and his glasses, there's sort of a stereotype that um, Asians are nerds. So no, we wouldn't want to use that. And I always found like uh, this other, the cartoon um, image beside him, I found, uh, I was, didn't feel like I related to that cartoon because there's so little information about Japanese people when I went through school. If I saw like this sort of small world images, I just felt like I was a cartoon and not a person. And uh, the, actually the first time I ever saw anything about Asians on TV was these dancing mushrooms uh, on Fantasia, it's a Disney show. And it was, uh, I, I had trouble eating mushrooms after because I, I was like very young and I don't know, like six or seven. And I'm just like, that's the first representation I saw, it's mushrooms. So I'm like, am I related to mushrooms is kind of how my mind went. And I, I didn't feel good about seeing those pictures, even though they were really cute. I, I didn't feel like I'm going, I didn't feel like a person. And then the other thing about, uh, this is a picture of Japanese internment camp. Now I think it's important to include things like residential school and the Japanese internment camp, uh, slavery in Canada. Those are important things to talk about. But if that's all you talk about, it doesn't make um, people from those marginalized groups feel very good. It often just makes them kind of feels like victims of history. Um, so one, if you do talk about the history, talk about also how they resisted and fought for change and uh, like Japanese Canadians fought to get uh, reparations back. Um, but also to just not his, um, not to just have historical images. Oh, here, I'm just gonna check the chat. Um, oh, what's your Jody Dirksen just sent a nice link for us if you guys can see there. And I can't seem to scroll back to see the, uh, what was that comment before? It's not letting me do it, sorry. So yeah, so that just for myself, these are some thoughts. And so you can do the same thing. Um, one of the teachers at my daughter's school, I was really happy about it because there was actually a student at her school who was gonna dress up as uh, an Asian for, for Halloween. She actually made a PowerPoint presentation showing like how, um, dressing up in costume of, as for race is not appropriate. And she went through like um, all the different races. So you, and even for my students, I do a similar thing as this. It's sad that you have to say what a stereotype it is, but you actually do. Even with grade 12 students, I, oops, sorry, I make them make a poster um, for, for a science fair that um, is trying to attract indigenous people and uh, women. And I still get like stereotypical cartoon images or historical images, even after I've talked about this. So it is something you need to uh, specifically talk to kids about. Yes, even with adults. So, um, so here in the top left corner, this is a picture as a kid that I would want to see of a, of a Japanese student, like a, a girl playing soccer. So like, cause that's what I liked when I was in school. Um, and the other things that are important when you go through to pick pictures for um, things you either put up in your class or when you create content is um, like just, we just wanna see regular 
pictures. Um, so I've got pictures of an indigenous students that are studying on laptops. Um, we have pictures of families show diversity, show two dads. The other thing too is if you're showing just um, pictures of like hands, a lot of the hands are white hands and I try to make it diverse. So like, but you have to think about it because that won't be the first picture that comes up. You'll actually have to search in brown hands on a keyboard. I'm just gonna check my chat here. I am Sikh first generation and married a white Canadian. My sister-in-law uh, was gifted stars at our wedding. One sister-in-law asked if she could wear her star for Halloween. That was a hard no for me. I said it is in the costume. Totally agree with that. Yes. So thank you for sharing. So yeah, just basically you want to just show um, mar people in marginalized um, communities just doing regular things. It's sad that you have to say that, but you actually do. So. Uh, Louise Campbell, I've looked for diverse hands without much luck. What do you search? I think I, I searched, um, I can't remember what I put in, but I think I actually put in like um, black woman hands keyboard. Like, yeah, you do have to kind of like mess around to find something. I can always send, send you the, I have the link of where it is. I can always send it to you later, Louise. So um, yes, yeah, so this is the part of the process that you do yourself role modeling to your kids and that you also help your kids to do when they create their PowerPoint presentations or other, or any content they're creating, blogs, et cetera. Um, and when I do this for some of my classes, I, or some of the um, criteria, I actually say, um, is it uh, uh, respect, respectfully representative and like sort of outline what it is so that they know when they're doing their projects that this is actually criteria I'm looking for in their selection of images. Um, whoops, I'll make a screen clear. So um, you choose content with a critical eye. Think about the message of an image, example, article, et cetera, you're using. And I, I always try to look at it from a uh, perspective of, of a child from a marginalized group. So what, um, will this build the self-esteem of somebody from this marginalized group or is it just um, fulfilling a stereotype? If it's, if it's just fulfilling a stereotype or demeans somebody from a marginalized group, then I get rid of that material and um, find something better. Um, have content where diverse kids are front and center also versus just being sidekicks, sidekicks and secondary characters. Um, provide modern representation, not just historical, traditional, for example, indigenous students on laptops. Um, and review and update your content regularly. For example, it used to be that we said Aboriginal, now Indigenous is um, more in use. So I've gone through and changed that. So I think it's also important as times change to like keep going through your material constantly to make sure that it's like woken up to date. So um, choose books that encourage empathy. Research shows that readers of literary fiction, so not formula pop fiction, um, are more empathetic. Um, look for books that put kids in new shoes. Here's some examples of books I liked. Um, so I'd, get, I'd like people right now in the chat to, or to speak up about books that they've recently read or used in their courses that they feel are really good at um, showing mar people from marginalized groups in a, in a positive light. Or it could be like a book that you yourself are reading. That's good. Oh, let's see here in my chat. Oh, Jody is saying The Hate You Give is one of the best books I've ever read. Yeah, I liked it too. Come on, your teachers. People, aren't you reading? It's a pandemic. <laughs> That's all we should be doing. Um, oh, Richard Wagamese, Keeper and Me. Yep. From Emily, thank you. Uh, Nicole Chase uh, uses a tapestry podcast in which a young woman named Grace tells us about her immigration to Regina. Nice. Stephanie Hall loved The Inconvenient Indian. Uh, Sieberton also likes Keeper and Me. Nice. So yes, uh, thank you for those examples. And uh, yeah, so, so for both yourself and your students, promote um, oh, stories. Oh, I've got more in the chat here. Uh, the entire Quebec government needs to read this list, <laughs> says Louise. Rick says, this place, 150 years retold. Oh, I haven't heard that one. That looks interesting. I'll have to check that out. Thank you. So yes, book choices are important. Um, check out diverse books, TV shows, movies, events, etc. cetera. Um, make sure to research the source of your book or movie. 
Um, ideally get them created by people from the actual group. So for example, Memoirs of a Geisha was written by a white man from the States. And there's um, controversy in Japan about it uh, because there's sort of this stereotype that geishas are prostitutes. I, I lived in Japan, they're not prostitutes, but there are many prostitutes who dress as geisha. So um, uh, yeah, this sort of the exoticizing of, of um, Japanese women is, is perpetuated in memoirs of a geisha. So ideally you find sources that are straight from the source versus an outside person looking in. Oh, let's see here. Uh, Jody looks like she shared a, a link with us. Um, oh, one new message. All right. Um, the other thing you can share with yourself and students is uh, there's shows like You Can't Ask That. So they talk, for example, they have um, different people from marginalized groups uh, talking about their experiences and the questions that, that they're asked that people shouldn't ask. And it's nice because it shows the diversity within the group. So I watched one about people who are blind and they all talked about how they all have different causes of their blindness. They all had different levels of blindness and they also had different ways of how they dealt with um, people's insensitivity towards them being blind. And so they have a, um, and also there's an Australian version that if you Google on YouTube, you can also use with kids. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna check my chat. Oh, Stony Creek Woman, Stephanie Hall, and a girl called Echo, Métis graphic novel. Ooh, that sounds good. Uh, it's COVID, but when it's un-COVID, uh, going to culture events, art shows, et cetera, to learn about different marginalized groups. Uh, another great way is just to follow diverse groups on social media. Um, oh, one more chat. Oh, Jody, the absolute true diary of a part-time Indian, also a good one. So, yeah, so probably the biggest way that we can reach out is uh, following diverse groups on social media. That keeps you kind of up to date on kind of like, issues and things that are going on. It can help you um, get ideas and sources for stuff to include in your courses. Um, ways to change content. If your class is diverse, create content using their names, their images, and their stories. So when I taught English in class, um, what I did was I had have uh, three, every student wrote down uh, two truths and a lie. And uh, I would use that at the beginning of every class and I would put in like spelling and grammar mistakes and kids would have to fix that, but they'd also learn about their other students and get familiar with their names and, and learn a little bit about them. So wherever you can uh, include that if there's diversity in your class. Uh, use names and examples that reflect diversity. So anywhere that it says Jane Doe uh, or John Doe, I don't include that. I make it 80% people of color names that you can do, you can like go online and Google baby names. Or what I like to do is I like to um, Google uh, uh, women's rights leaders or uh, um, civil rights leaders or um, people who are doing things with, within different countries. So I just type in like Laos or Thailand or uh, Mexico or Venezuela. And I all the names and all my examples are from places around the world. Also, when you use examples, reflect the diversity. So. Um, Although Jazz Winder could like to make butter chicken, I think it's nice to mix it up, especially in Canada. We, um, uh, you know, Jazz Winder could easily make, um, be making sushi. You need to do double the recipe in a math example. So uh, yeah, try to mix it up and make people think outside the box a little bit. Um, even no matter what you teach, you can talk about what's happening in the news because that helps um, um, those marginalized students feel like, okay, yeah, there's big events happening and my teacher recognizes that no matter what your course is in, to, to share your thoughts. Um, call out isms and phobias wherever you find them. So for example, the outsiders, they, it has some racist elements. They talk about scalping somebody and there's also the word squaw. Don't just read, read over that and ignore it. Like say that it's in there, say that it's not right. Have a discussion with the class about why do you think we still use this book if it has this information because that's the only book my school had at the time. Um, talk about um, uh, what it says about the author and what it says about society even that that allowed them to feel okay about writing that book. And even should we still have that book, like we should change it to the, the hate, hate you give instead. Um, don't just change the, the content of your class or your um, classwork, but your classroom. Try to reflect the rainbow of diversity. Have posters, dolls, books, etc. If you're a kindergarten teacher, make 80% of the dolls you have people of color. Um, and find some boys too. Make, make it 50-50. So 
these are just some ideas as ways to change the content. Here. Tab. Um, research. Um, your connections help build empathy. Research finds that just knowing that a white neighbor is a friend of a person of color reduces prejudice in that person. So sharing your personal stories is so important um, because it can change how students um, think about other people and it can foster understanding from LGBTQ to disability. So like a, a personal story I like to share with students with disabilities is I went to grad with the guy who it was his third grad. He had a variety of learning disabilities and uh, really struggled in school, but he still kept plugging. And uh, when he graduated, he really wanted to be a police officer and it took him a long time to, to get through college and then he ended up working for the city, but he still kept trying and applying to be a police officer. And finally, when he was 40, he was able to make his goal. And they actually uh, did a write-up in the paper of it. And I just tell kids like, um, you know, it's hard and it's difficult, but if you keep trying, you can make it. So it's like a, my, my connection gives students in my class who have disabilities um, a role model that they can make it. And I also acknowledge that, hey, it took them a long time to do it and a lot of work, but if you're really passionate about something, you can make it happen. Uh, and so and so, whenever something comes up, whenever I can, I try to include positive stories like that from my own life experience to, to have the kids connect and have a, a good role model. Um, let's see, oh, that sort of replies that. Um, if you uh, don't have uh, a lot of good stories and regardless of you, you don't bring in speakers um, like indigenous elders, um, somebody to come talk about the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, people with disabilities, et cetera, bring them in to make connections with people um, for those students so that they can see them as real people and break the stereotypes they might have. And it's also good role models for the um, kids from those marginalized groups. Um, it's important to talk about the different isms and pho phobias in our society, talk about what microaggressions are, because if you think about it, um, I like to think about it like, uh, there's actually a really good video, but they swear too much in it, so I can't include it, but to think of microaggressions as, as mosquito bites. So like if you're constantly getting bit, it's going to make you um, not feel so good. It'll, it'll affect not only your physical health, but your mental health and how um, by talking about, you can talk to your class about how do we create a supportive space. When I teach um, in, in class, at the beginning of the year, uh, we, I, I talk to kids about how it's important to create a supportive space and I get them to brainstorm and make posters about how to cr create it. So um, to, as a world citizen, you wanna make everybody feel included and uh, you, need to you need to address the problems and then how to fix it so you can make that space a good space for your kids. Um, the other thing that's important to do with kids is um, listening skills are really important. Um, I teach uh, how to do active listening, responding with empathy, and talk about how it's important for kids from marginalized groups to have their experience validated because it impacts their mental health to have it ignored. Oh, it looks like I'm going over time here. I'm just gonna, if you're gonna hold in here, I'll like quickly try to go through this. Um, use yourself as a role model. None of us were born with the knowledge that we now have about equity and diversity and use your own stories to talk about how you unlearn things and share your own personal stories if you have them where you faced adversity, especially if you're um, from a marginalized group, you can be a great role model for your kids. And um, the studies show that if you, uh, kids who have the same gender and race um, role model to them, that actually improves how they do in school and how they feel about themselves. Oh, I just got one more person in the chat here. Oh, excellent, thank you, Jody. Yes, um, so uh, we're just gonna close it. We are works in progress. Um, oh, the other thing I try to role model with my kids is saying sorry if I've made any mistakes. And um, so for example, I had, um, uh, what is it? Um, a conflict sheet that said man versus man, man versus society. And I had a student say, hey, that's sexist, Ms. Nicholson. And like, oh, you're totally right. Thank you so much for bringing it up for me. And uh, then I changed it. So um, as a teacher, be open to feedback and to change and um, role model yourself saying sorry, making amends. Um, and the last part is uh, acting for change. Do an inquiry based project with class to tackle an isner phobia either, either as a whole class or like individually. Um, speak out and share ideas in all your spheres about um, 
um, all your spheres of influence about isms and phobia. So not just in your classroom, but your friends, I don't know, even somebody at the coffee shop, if you're overhearing them, broaden your bubble, support a cause and think outside the box and you can even question school traditions and practices. Uh, just to end off, uh, a friend of mine, um, she's indigenous and she said wearing hats she hates that rule because she knew kids the reason why they wore hats was because they couldn't afford haircuts and they couldn't control their hair so they use hats to kind of deal with that so it made me think huh like my own privilege to, to be able to afford haircuts not to to thought of that so i uh, just want to end off with that i hope you use your global citizen glasses to see the problem represent diversity positively uh, change content, share your stories and act to make our classes and our communities more anti-racist and inclusive. Um, so that that's it, I guess, if anybody has any questions or if you need to go, go. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm just gonna check with that. That's amazing, Tamiko, thank you oh. so much. Oh, I'm glad I don't you, know if you can. I don't know if you can hear me actually. Don't oh, I can hear you. Okay, good, sorry. <laughs> It's with too many computers and too many audio devices. Thank you yeah, for yeah. Oh, an amazing presentation. I was trying to keep notes in the shared document that people can refer back to as well, but uh, the chat's blowing up as well with huge thank yous and, and um, just a ton of appreciation. This is a really powerful presentation. I'm glad that we have it on a recording and that other people will have the opportunity to look back at it as well. And I per personally have gotten a ton of takeaways as well. Um, and I love the metaphor for those global citizen glasses and I'll be sure I'll sure be using that as well. Everybody, yeah, wear them and spread the glasses. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're free, right? So, yeah. Oh, um, OC, so, yeah, OC Richardson is going to use the math uh, village. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, ton, tons of amazing stuff. And um, we don't have to rush out of here. We can have some questions. Um, I do have to launch another Zoom room on my other computer, but I just wanted to yeah. just say a huge thank you and a huge shout out uh, on behalf of the entire uh, organizing committee and, and everybody that's here. What a powerful presentation and and thank you so much, Timiko. All right, thank you so much for helping me, Thomas. I wouldn't have been able to do this without you. Yeah, so, no <laughs> worries. <laughs> you did great. And if great. anybody has any questions, I, um, I, I'll stick around here for a bit. I actually have a question.